And we are happy to welcome back to the program Natalie Angier. She is the science columnist for the New York Times and the author of The Canon, a whirligig tour of the beautiful basics of science. She joins us on the line from Washington, D.C. Natalie, good to have you here again. Last time we saw each other was at Quantum to Cosmos uh, back in uh, October. So thanks for sparing some time for us. How are you tonight? I'm um, pretty good. Glad to Very hear it. Very good, in fact. I'm going to start by reading a little piece of the report you wrote uh, last December in the New York Times that got so many people buzzing about this topic. The more that scientists learn about the complexity of plants, their keen sensitivity to the environment, the speed with which they react to changes in the environment, and the extraordinary number of tricks that plants will rally to fight off attackers and solicit help from afar, the more impressed researchers become and the less easily we can dismiss plants as so much fiberfill backdrop, passive sunlight collectors on which deer, antelope, and vegans can conveniently graze. Okay, let's get into this a little bit. Tell us some of the ways that you've discovered that plants are sensitive and reactive to their environment. Well, the more I found out, the more amazing it was. Um, let me just give one example of an extraordinary adaptation of a plant that um, is able to repel uh, moths that want to lay eggs on its leaves. And it does this by responding to a material that had been deposited in the female after she had mated with the male. This particular chemical the male had used to try to get the female to basically stop mating and to just have him be the father of her eggs. And this particular chemical, the plant, it's a kind of a pine, will pick up on and um, use it to release volatiles into the air that will then solicit the help of parasitic wasps that can come to help the plant fend off the attack by depositing their eggs into the larvae of its enemy, the herbivore that wants to eat it. And so it's using a chemical from the female, a mating chemical from the female, to call in attackers, these parasitic wasps, and uh, get the, to protect itself. This to me seems like a form of, I don't want to say sort of conscious behavior, but it, it certainly is far more elaborate than anything we would have suspected even as recently as 10 years ago. Now as a science reporter, I guess nothing surprises you because science continually amazes us, but um, go, go Tell us a little bit about that. Presumably at some point along the way, this came as uh, a bit of news to you that plants had these capabilities that no one had ever thought of beforehand. Is that fair to say? Yes. I think that this ability of plants to call for help has been an extraordinary finding. It, these many different species of plants have been found to release these signals, these SOS signals into the air that then attract uh, predaceous uh, say dragonflies or even some other vertebrates that might feed on the insects that are feeding on the plant and they do it in ways that are very specific so they might for example release the chemicals at night if they're hoping to attract some some night flying predator or they might do it in pulses as a kind of a way of of saying here come here come here and this is something that I think nobody would have guessed. I mean, we know that plants defend themselves. We know that their leaves are full of, of tannins that make them unappetizing. Um, but the fact that they actually communicate with their surroundings has been a real surprise. And they not only communicate through the air, they communicate through the soil. And they seem to communicate to other plants. So other plants, if they receive signals of, of these volatiles, they'll say, aha, I better ramp up my own defenses. So it's a way of, of kind of communicating with the surrounding area, both to attract um, help and to warn off other plants that may or may not be, in fact, related to you. But you're not so going so far as behaviors. to say that it's conscious. No, not conscious, but what is consciousness? Um, one of the things that happened after I wrote this article, and I can tell you that this article generated more comments than any other science story, I think. Mm -hmm. Not just mine, but any. And I think that, um, well, that's not true because every time they write about creationism and religion, that also elicits a lot of comments. But this one got a lot of people riled up because I think they don't, they just can't accept that plants are, the word, the key word is sentient. 
Now, sentience is a really fuzzy kind of concept, and none of the plant biologists, well, the ones I spoke with at least, are going to say, oh, yes, plants are definitely sentient. But they do say that they're aware. So I'm not quite sure what the difference is, except for perhaps, you know, fine points of debating. But the truth is that plants have been co-evolving with animals for hundreds of millions of years, and they're extraordinary, extraordinarily sophisticated, and they're also, um, they're very vulnerable because they can't run away. So in some ways, they're more sophisticated than animals. And I think we have to take that into account when we decide sort of what's the, the kind of the little totem pole of, of who should be eaten. Well, you've taken me nicely to where I want to go next because these developments are not only fascinating for the science that they reveal, but also because they do raise a lot of questions about the ethics of what we can now eat. Gary Steiner, who wrote Animals in the Moral Community, has said, let me be candid. By and large, meat eaters are a self-righteous bunch. Now, you don't eat meat, and we'll get to the issues of whether or not we should be eating these plants, given what we now know, but just take that quote alone. Is he right about that? I think, I have to say that I think sometimes vegans and vegetarians can be self-righteous. The problem is that we are, we as animals um, are not capable of making our own food the way plants do. Um, they are autotrophs, they make their own food. We're heterotrophs, basically we have to eat other organisms to survive. And that's, to me, a fundamental tragedy of being an animal, is that you have to kill to live. Um, and we are all doing it. So the question is, how, how do you put that into context? How do you accept it about your life? I mean, we all have different ways of dealing with it. But what's happened with this kind of ethical veganism and ethical vegetarianism is that all of a sudden, they're saying that they are more ethical than people that eat meat. Um, and I'm saying, wait a minute. What are you doing to make yourself feel that way? What are you, how are you dismissing this in whole other kingdom with which we share the planet? And that's where I think it gets a little bit dicey. I think that there are environmental reasons, good environmental reasons, to be vegetarian as opposed to eating meat. But wh whether you're saying you're doing it because you're, you know, you're not causing any suffering, well, I don't know if that's true. Can you just take 30 seconds before we go further? Some of our viewers may not appreciate the distinction between a vegetarian and a vegan. Can you help us on that? Yes, vegetarians, um, they don't eat any, any meat, but they might eat dairy products or eggs, um, honey, which is, of course, made by bees. Vegans eat no products that are either from animals or made by animals. So they, they are strictly you know, plant-based diet, and they don't supplement it with anything from animals. Um, so that's, you know, I think that that's fine if, if that's the decision you make. There maybe are good health reasons to do it, but if you're feeling like you're going to, as I said, just sort of get there up in, in the moral penthouse, I'm not so sure that's true. Hmm. That's what I was calling into question. Let me pursue this issue of ethics a little further, and to that end, I want to read an excerpt from Live Science from last August. And the quote goes like this, the pitcher plant is the world's second largest and can grow to more than four feet tall with a pitcher-shaped structure filled with liquid. The plant secretes nectar around its mouth to lure rats, insects, and other prey into its trap. Once an animal has fallen in, enzymes and acids in the fluid break down the carcass of the drowned victim. All carnivorous plants have evolved to catch insects, but the biggest ones, such as this one, can eat rats and frogs said Stuart McPherson, who led the research team. Uh, you know, if there are plants that have evolved this much to become, dare we say it, carnivorous, the notion of eating right. vegan, is that unnatural now at this point? I think it's difficult to be uh, a vegan. I, I think that there are evolutionary reasons that it's not quite what we're, we're kind of designed to do in terms of our metabolism. Um, our digestive system, our teeth. I do think that people can make the decisions they want to make uh, about what they're going to eat. Um, but it's true. I mean, yes, there are carnivorous plants. There's this plant called the daughter plant, 
which is parasitic on other plants and actually listens in to those cues of, for help from other plants and uses that to, uh, you know, sort of, they, they actually, you can almost see them moving towards the plants. So there's this sense of, of motion that they even get into it. So the distinctions are perhaps a lot less clear cut. And yes, there are, par there are carnivorous plants, there are parasitic plants. Um, life is complicated, and I, I, I do think that it's difficult to, to set yourself above or apart from that complexity. Well, let me make it even more complicated. Which has more of a right to life, animals or plants? Um, yeah, well, you know, I, as I said in, in my column, if you were going to sort of talk about ethics, well, how about making your mo food from the sun? That's pretty ethical. But of course, plants have also evolved to need sources of nitrogen, which usually come from animals. So there, there are, you know, it's it's not it's not as clear as it used to be back in the, you know, sort of the early days of life on Earth. Um, but I think that we have to just accept that life is a great big. It's a river of life. It's a cycle. We're all part of it. We're all sort of swimming along. We're doing the best that we can, and we too are going to be recycled. It's just the way life works. So whether you do it today or 10 years from now or 20, whatever it happens to be, you're only here for a short amount of time. You, if you're an animal, you have to, to eat other organisms to stay alive. But you too will become fodder for the next generation. That's part of the beauty and, and the tragedy of life. Okay, but I'm going to push a little further on this because some people watching this will say, wait a second, when an animal is killed to become food for a human, or even more so when they're killed by another animal for food for another animal, that's not a painless process. Uh, and in some cases, that can be an, uh, an agonizing, gruesome process. Plants may be able, I gather the discovery has come, may be able to feel something when they are being killed for food, but it can't be comparable to what animals feel. Is that fair to say? I don't know if that's fair to say. That's the question I raise, because the truth is that plants react to being attacked extremely quickly and extremely violently. When a plant is attacked by uh, an herbivore, it, it's like its whole system is activated to fight that off and to try to protect itself. And so, you know, you have a host of chemicals that are released, that are released internally. Uh, there are mechanical reactions that happen. It's not something that is just, okay, that's fine. I mean, you can't hear it because they don't have, they don't make those kinds of noises and you don't see blood running, but there's no question that the reactions that are activated by attack are very strong and in some ways quicker than what you see with an animal. So I'm not sure that, that it isn't a form of, of pain, um, but it's hard to say. Some people argue that even animals and certainly, you know, uh, so, sort of lower animals, insects, whatever, they don't feel pain. Well, I don't, I'm not sure. Everything is struggling to stay alive. And if it's doing it in this very violent way, the way plants do, is that not a form of, of crying? So we may have to it, rethink you know, our think, concept of pain then. I, I think that we have to take into account the fact that, that everything wants to survive and the plants have developed an incredible host of defenses against being eaten. And they're pretty good at it most of the time, in hmm. fact. As one of the scientists said to me, most, most plants, most herbivores cannot breach the defenses of most plants. They tend to have to specialize because plants are really built to try to fend off attack. So in our last minute then, Natalie, if you are an ethical person and you want to eat ethically, do you now have to give up on plants? Um, I don't think so. I think what you have to do is, I think, perhaps just be more aware and more appreciative. I think that to the extent that we can eat um, organically, environmentally, uh, sustainably, that's all to the good. Uh, you know, the sort of large-scale agriculture like factory farming is, is doing a lot of damage on many different levels. So perhaps 
you know, I think organic farming and small farming, um, those are ways to try to respect nature and what you're going to be eating rather than just sort of like go in there slashing and burning. I think that all of that makes you a, a relatively more, at least, you know, sentient being, uh, not just taking it for granted that it's here for your use. Always fascinating to have you on the program, Natalie. Thanks so much for joining us on the line from Washington. Well, I was glad to be here.